worship the Lord today.
the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood
your voice to the King of Kings. Come on, he's holy. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Come on, Jesus is Lord. He's the king of everything. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's, he's destroyed your biggest enemy. He's made a way for you. And the Bible says he's making intercession for you right now and preparing a place to be with you forever. I think that's worthy of some worship this morning. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Woo, let me catch my breath. That's good. <laughs> hey, why don't you just fist bump the person next to you as you're seated. Tell them they look good. Oh, so glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome to Life Church. We're glad that you're here. And if you're here for the first time, you have a, it's just a special welcome from us. And if I haven't met you yet, my name's Tim, I'm the pastor, and super excited that you're here. Maybe you came yesterday to, the, uh, to our outreach, and we welcome you back. And we're so glad that you're here. And we're so uh, thankful that you took time uh, to come worship with us. Uh, we want you to know a couple of things. First of all, that you're loved and accepted, and there's a place here that you can receive that encouragement. Um, and we want you to feel right at home, and so we're going to invite you to kind of do what we do every week. If you'll reach to the seat back in front of you and grab one of these real quick. Everyone around you, you'll do the same. Grab a connection card, grab the pen, and put your name and check the box that says first time guest. Unless, of course, it's not the first time, and then you can put second or third time guest. Um, and take a few moments to fill that out. Let me tell you the motivation. Uh, we just want to be there for you. So if you put an address down, I'll probably send you a letter in the mail. Remember that thing at the end of the driveway or up by the door, a mailbox? I'll probably send you a letter in the mail. And if you send it, give me an email address, I'll probably send an email. So that's the purpose. We just want to be there for you. So just know your information is safe with us. And uh, we want you to know that. And on the back, there's a place for prayer request. We want to be praying for you. And so if you'll write it down, you have our promise that we'll be praying for you this very week. And so uh, feel free to write down whatever it is that you're believing God for, and we're going to uh, partner with you in that. At the end of the service, we'll receive these connection cards together, along with our regular offering. And know as, if you're a guest today, there's like no pressure for you to give anything, but that's available to you if you'd like. You'll notice on the screen behind me, there's several ways to give, and you can scan that QR code. It takes you to a, um, a, an online site, a safe, secure, electronic way to give. Um, so you can give that way, or you can give um, kind of the traditional way. There's an envelope right there beside the connection card. At the end of the service, we'll receive all those together, uh, and you can drop those off with the ushers. If you're a guest, we've got a gift for you. So as you go out to the lobby, through those doors to the left, our hospitality team will be there to greet you, and we want to just bless you. We can answer any questions you have or uh, just uh, be a blessing to you. We just have a small gift of appreciation to let you know how much we're uh, thankful that you are here. So you can hold these to the very end. Take a few moments to fill it out. Oh, before you put it away, one more thing. This Wednesday night, we've got a spaghetti supper, and you're invited. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that we did this was because we wanted to invite our first, second, third time guests to come, come be part of that spaghetti supper. So this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, everybody say 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, we've got a spaghetti supper. And in order to make appropriate um, reservations, <laughs> take, uh, just make sure you put, if you're planning on being there, spaghetti supper on the back, and we'll know. We want you to be part of that. Know it's available for you. The spaghetti supper will be in the building 
up the hill, the metal building up there in our cafeteria. And then we invite you to stay afterwards to be part of some Bible studies. So we'd love for you to come be part of that um, uh, with us this very week. I just want to brag on this church for just a moment. Yesterday or this week, last week, I guess Sunday's the first day of the week. Last week was a huge week for us, a huge week. So many of you just gave of yourself and gave of yourself and gave of yourself. And, and we were able to collectively do an incredible thing. We gave almost uh, five tons of food away. We saw over 130 people respond in some way, shape, or form to the gospel message, come forward to receive prayer, receive the Bible, the words of Jesus, put it in their hand. We prayed with them. We're following up on them. And I just want to say, if you had any part of that, whether you came Wednesday morning or Wednesday night, well, and, and maybe you came back yesterday too, and, and you're thinking, Pastor, um, if you ask us to do one more week like that, I think I'm going to pass out. <laughs> Thank you so much for your giving. Thank you so much for making a difference. Thank you so much for all that you did for this community to show the love of Jesus. Can you give uh, those who helped out this week a big hand and a thank you? Incredible. 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 Thank you so much. Well, right now, Ronnie Murray's going to come and make a special announcement. And I'm going to ask my wife if she'll join me real quick on the platform. Good morning. <laughs> Today is a very special day. It's a day that we set aside to show our appreciation for our pastor. You know, we've, we've been announcing this for the last few weeks, and I hope you came prepared to show your appreciation. If you didn't, don't worry. Don't worry. Every day is a good day to show your appreciation. We have a So much so that the whole church is going to be prepared for Friday night. We're going to do what we do for you to show appreciation. It was, it was difficult because there's so many things that can be said. But you know what? What do you say about what someone who has submitted to the call of God on their lives? Someone who has a heart and a passion for those that are lost? Someone who cares about us, someone who's willing to help during our times, in our times of birth, in our times of sickness, in our times of wedding, and he mourns with us, with us in, it, in our loss. Pastor Tim, we deeply appreciate you, and we consider you to be the man of the hour for this church. You have brought the church through many difficult times and each week continue to bring to us the healing anointing word when he gets up here he speaks life to us he speaks to us and shows us how that God the word that God has for us desire for God to bless this flock is evident. And I also know that behind every man there's a loving and supporting woman. That's Miss Jenny. We love you. You support the pastor and his efforts and work toward the good of this church. You are a blessing. Thank you. Vanessa, at this time, would you come forward? We have some gifts that we'd like to present. Is Vanessa, Vanessa? Oh, there she is.
the end of the service, along with the regular tithes and offerings, there will be a chance for you to participate in a very special offering for our pastor. Please mark your gifts with pastor appreciation or pastor Tim so we'll know the designation. There will also be a basket out in the foyer for your cards, your notes, and your gifts. Thank you. Don't miss this opportunity to show your appreciation for our pastor. Pastor, at this time, I'd like for us to pray for you. Oh, thank you. Jamie, okay? Yeah. Uh, would the leadership or anyone that would like, as far as that goes, just come forward and, and we'll, we'll pray for the pastor. Would you mind? I'll tell you what, with the burdens that our pastor shares with each of us each week, he needs God's strength and God's help. I'll, uh, I'll lead the prayer, and would everybody pray with us at this time? Father, we thank you for your love and your blessings. And one of those blessings is that, Lord Jesus, you gave us leadership. Lord Jesus, you gave me a loving couple, that, Lord Jesus, that loves us and is passionate about this church. Father, I pray blessings upon them. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would anoint them with power, Lord Jesus. Anoint their hands that everything they touch, Lord, would be blessed. Lord, I pray that you would uh, supply their needs physically, spiritually, financially. Lord Jesus, give him vision. Give direction, O oh God, in his life. Let him, Lord Jesus, sense your spirit each day and sense the power of your spirit. Lord Jesus, empower them. Jesus' name. Amen. Ronnie. Here a second. The microphone. Jane, come up a second. We just want to take a moment to say to say thank you. It really is our honor and joy. Thank you for the gift cards um, for me to go out to Outback Steakhouse. And if 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 you're nice, I'll take you with me. Thank you. Thank you for the gift card for my yeah, wife. I'm lucky, I'll go with oh, you. Oh, well. <laughs> I, I told her if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. So I'm, that's it. But Jamie, you just want to say something real quick? Yeah, so I had a quick reflection of uh, just, first of all, just what a privilege it is to do this. And I just reflected back to when I was a young girl, I was actually a senior in high school. And my youth pastor uh, spoke a word over me mm. and said to prepare my heart for for ministry. That I would, he even, the Lord spoke to me ahead of time, you'll marry somebody and go into full-time ministry with him. And so it's just reflecting back to that moment. And at the time, to be honest, I was like, yeah, that's just going to happen. <laughs> that's like a really sweet thought. Um, but just to see what God has done and just to see what a privilege it is to be a part of ministry it was something that scared the life out of me but it is such a privilege and um, we love you guys so much um, you're a very special church um, we've been around other ministers and and but uh, part of other churches and you're very unique and I want you to know that <laughs> You have loved us really well. Yeah. You know, all our kids are out of the house now. You loved our kids mm. really well. Thank you. And I just want to let you know how much we love you and thank you so much for doing that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll let you. Would you take that for me? And don't, I know, I know what's in there. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, it is it is really a joy um, if I stood before you and said it's not hard I would be dishonest with you it is hard but but all of us whenever you follow the plans and purposes of God he has like zero problem with making us uncomfortable at times for our own good right for our growth and so thank you so much for uh, letting us be um, regular people called by God that are imperfect but seeking the perfect one and we love you so much and it's a, it's a joy to to be able to do this and and so thank you 
uh, from the bottom of our heart, really, and thank you on behalf of our kids who today, um, our, our youngest is uh, in church in Lakeland, Florida. Our middle one is serving at a church in Battle Creek, Michigan with his wife, and our uh, oldest will be at church, whatever time it is in California, in a couple hours. Um, and we just want to say thank you for helping us uh, pass the baton uh, to them as well. We, we love you. Well, grab your Bibles. We're starting a new series today called Kings and Queens. And I'm super excited about this, super excited about this series. And turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll read that in, in just a moment. Um, you, ever, you ever seen someone who is in the process of making a horrible decision? <laughs> and you're like on the outside, and you can see it happening almost like in slow motion, right? You, you can see it um, watching and no matter what you can, no matter what you do, it's like you can't stop it. You ever, you ever been in a situation like that? It's like you see the train coming, and it's coming around the bend. Um, you haven't seen sunshine since I don't know when, and um, thank you. And you see it coming. Now, I, ha I seem to have this gift for other people. <laughs> but but at times I get completely blindsided myself and like why didn't I see that coming right why didn't I see that one coming it's like where did that come from and so um, if it just let you know I'm I have this gift of seeing uh, others flaws <laughs> but I have a blind side to my own right and so I don't know if you share in any of that um, uh, a gift set or not but but we, we've seen it, and so what I want us to do is look at the kings and queens of the Old Testament and ask ourselves, all right, what did, they, what did they go through? What did God teach them? And maybe they made a mistake, or maybe they learned a lesson that, so I don't have to. I'll, I'll let them reap the, the, um, the, the, the pain of the bad decision. I'll get the good out of it, so I don't have to go down that track in, uh, and follow that bad decision. So we're going to look at that. We're starting with David, King David, uh, probably, well, would be the, the most famous king of the Old Testament. And we're going to look at David's life before he came, became the king, before he came the king. And so 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, here's what it says. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse in Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. You're to anoint for me the one I indicate. So what can we learn? You might say to yourself, look, I'm not the boss. I'm not in charge of, not sure I'm in charge of anything. I'm, I'm not a king or a queen, so what does this have to do with me? What I would say to you is you actually are more royal than you realize. You're a queen or you're a king of your kingdom, right? You're in charge of your life. You're in charge of your domain. You're in charge of decisions that you make. And so you may not realize this, but you're sitting right next to royalty, as a matter of fact. You're sitting right next to the, a queen or a king of their... Why don't you just acknowledge that they're the king or a queen this morning? Just, you know, just acknowledge that. Uh, I, I acknowledge that you are a king. I acknowledge that you're a queen, right? I acknowledge that this morning. I didn't realize I was in the presence of royalty. But I do now. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for pointing that out. It was a Wednesday night. Jamie was home with the kids. One wasn't feeling well, 
And I think she had just given birth a second or third one. I was wrapping up the youth service, made my way to the auditorium, talking to somebody, and in comes shooting back out the, in the door, somebody. Interrupted my conversation and said, Jamie needs you right now. There's an there's emergency. You need to go right now. Come with me. So they whisked me out there. She's in the van crying. I said, what happened? She said, um, Luke has drank milk and his, um, he closed up. Just before he did, I was able to dump Benadryl down his throat. He opened back up. Let's go to the emergency room now. So I didn't know that a Dodge Caravan could go like 102, um, <laughs> right, down whatever interstate that is in, in Mobile on the way to the hospital. And so we're just going, and, and I'm overwhelmed with the moment. Um, he, he was little. We didn't know how allergic to milk he was. He grabbed, he'd never done this, grabbed a glass of his mom's milk, just, and he it mimicked like he was drinking, apparently he drank some of it. And he comes down the hall doing this, can't articulate, and she knew enough, grabbed the Benadryl and got some down him. He started closing up and he opened back up and we got to go. So we went to the emergency room and we came rushing to the door and we explained to him what the deal was. And then we, uh, they, they quickly began to tend to him and we began to wait. And we began to wait. So what I did not know is the effects of the antihistamine can wear off quicker than the uh, um, ill effects of an aller allergic response. So they said, what we got to do is we got to sit here and wait for some hours. So we'll keep him, right? He's fine now, but what we don't want you to do is go home, right? And that Benadryl wear off, and then the allergic response is still strong enough, right? So we began to wait, and we waited. And the good thing was, at that point, he was in good hands. He's in care. We're, we're feeling better. But we waited and waited, Jamie, what was it, three or four in the morning? And we're just, we're, we're, after the newness wears off of the, uh, you know, rushing into the room and the emergency, and you ever been in the waiting room? And you're just, the waiting room is exhausting. It's exhausting, it's, you're nodding off, you're trying to, your, your head's throbbing, you're just, you just don't even know what time it is. It's just, the waiting room can be difficult. Here's what I learned. Before God reveals your destiny, he'll take you through a transition. And many times, your desert or your waiting period is part of your destiny. It precedes it. Before Jesus went into public ministry, the Bible says the Spirit of God led him into the desert to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit of God led him in the desert. And maybe this morning, some of you are in a waiting period. You're, you're in the wilderness and, and, and it may, I would suggest to you, it may not be that you're in your wilderness, God has abandoned you. It may be that God is leading you. And it may be not that God is punishing you in this season. It may be that he's positioning you for what he has next. And while we're in the waiting room, it can be difficult. Um, and we make some of our worst decisions when we're anxiously waiting, right? The waiting room's the worst. So I want to bring out three truths that we can gather from the story of David before he's king. And the first one is this. Your destiny is an issue of the heart. Your destiny is an issue of the heart. Your purpose is an issue of, of the heart. So in the story, there's a prophet. Samuel's a prophet. God says to Samuel, hey, I want you to go anoint the next king. Samuel kind of argues and said, I already did that, right? Um, this king won't like that if I go anoint another king. God says, don't worry about that. I'm making a change. That's the Mills paraphrase version, MPV, Mills paraphrase version. So he gets, God gives him instructions. We read it. Take a sacrifice with you. Go to Jesse. Go to Jesse. He's got a bunch of boys, enough to make a football team almost. And they're good looking. They're sharp. They're, 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 they're you know, go to Jesse and I'm going to show you, right? 
I'm going to show you. So he goes to Jesse, and they kind of freak out. They're like, what's the deal? He said, no, 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 it's good. I've come with a word, but gather everybody together. He does a ceremony, consecrates them, and he says, hey, I want to see your sons. So he brings the first son, Eliab, the oldest, the most likely, right? It's Eliab to be the next king. And the Bible says he's good looking, he's sharp, you know, he's got like a, a, a half million followers on Instagram, he, everybody loves him, he's cool, he's got a great job, you know, he's got all the whatever, right, drip. And so, they, and they said, no, 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 God says, no, it's not him. And so I just says, well, where's the next one? He said, well, uh, um, here's, here's uh, uh, Abinadab. And he goes through the whole thing, the whole thing, the whole thing, and they're like, no, not him. Jesse said, well, okay, third time's a charm, right? Isn't that say somewhere in the Bible? Probably not, but third time's a charm, right? Uh, Shema, Shema, yeah, bring, bring him. Oh, he, I'm just telling you, man, he's the man, he's the man. The prophet goes through all the boys, and he gets to the last one, he's like, the, is, do you have, I know God told, I know God told me, do you have another one? He said, I do. God tells Samuel, throw it up there, verse, uh, verse 7, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward, right? But the Lord looks at the heart. In the waiting room, God wants to work on our heart. In the waiting room, God wants to work on your heart. Everyone else notices what's on the outside. I walked in the door this morning, um, and some of the young people uh, uh, began to compliment me. Happy um, um, Pastor Appreciation Day. And I think the quote was, your head looks particularly shiny today. And I thank you, Sister Cooper. If your mom and dad are enjoying themselves in Boston, you're prancing around complimenting your pastor. And I will just have to say this. The sunlight was coming in at just the right angle. I mean, I was in the lobby. That true story, actually. Some of these I make up, but that one I did not. We see the outside first, right? Our vision is limited. Your vision of yourself is limited. Unless you put on God goggles. God says, I don't look at what everybody else looks at. I look on the, come on, on the heart, on the inside. Don't make a decision based on your limited vision. Make a decision based upon what I will show you. That's what God says. What we need in the waiting room is God's sight. To keep your focus on what's important. In, 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 the, in, the, in the waiting season, God says, I want to work on your heart. I want to work on your heart. And I don't, I don't know what you're believing God for next. I don't know where God's leading you next, but I would say to you that in this season, the most important thing that he's doing, and write this down, he wants to work on our heart. He wants to work on our heart. God is looking for servants. He's looking for servants in the kingdom with integrity, with flexibility, with teachability. Your heart. Um, interesting. This was written before um, cardiovascular surgery. It was written before. The heart simply means the inner, inner person. It means the inner person. That part of you, your, your thoughts, your, your will, your desires, your decisions. What's on the inside, right? Everybody else sees the outside, but God sees what's really going on. Everybody sees the shell, right? God sees us at the core. God sees our heart. And we've talked about this maybe three weeks out of the last five, Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, what's it say? Guard your right 
heart. Above all else, God is your heart, for everything you do flows from it. God says, I skipped that one that you thought was the most likely. There's another one because I'm looking for a certain heart, not for a certain height. God works on the inner man. He's working on the inside. And some of you are in transition. You're in it's like change mode. You're in what's next mode. Maybe you feel like you're in the waiting room. Maybe you feel like you're like three in the morning in the waiting room. You're like, I don't know if I can keep waiting like this. God says, let me work on your heart. Let me work on your heart. If you're in the wilderness, God says, let me work on your heart. If you're, if you're in, a, in the waiting room, God says, let me work on your heart. Let, let me work on your desires. Let, let, me, let me work with you. Uh, I, Surrender to me, look at me young people, surrender to me your passions, your goals, your desires, what are, you, what are you asking God for? Surrender that to me in this season. And I feel like this is a prophecy actually. And God says to us, let me work on your heart. And if you will hear it through my frail voice as the words of God, I tell you it will transform us. Let, let me work on your heart. Let me work on your idols. Let me work on what, what you think is important. Let me work on that. Sister, pretty green dress. Let me work on your heart. God says, my YMCA buddy right there. Yeah, I won't embarrass you. Call you. No, you're about you, not your mama. Let me, let me work on your heart, right? Let me work on your heart. <laughs> you thought you were in a waiting season and it was a wasted season but what i'm telling you it's not a wasted season it's a preparation season it's a preparation season god had his hand on a little boy that nobody knew about nobody knew about him they they left him out of the family reunion <laughs> well i guess someone's got to be out there working well I'll stick it to david yeah he's a little runt of the family Let him do it. God wants to make your waiting season into productive season. Don't waste the season that you're in. Let God work on your heart. Your destiny is an issue of the heart. God sees, uh, everyone else sees the outside, right? God says, I don't look at that. I don't look at that. I look at the heart. Number two, your purpose requires God's anointing. Your purpose requires God's anointing. Let's go back to the story. 1 Samuel 16, verse 11. So he asked, are these all the sons you have? He's a little confused, right? God, I thought you told me. <laughs> I know you told me. Where? But you said, skip them, skip them, skip them. We're to the end. There's nobody left. So he says, Where are the, do you have any left? Oh, they're, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Now, cultural context, that was like taking out the garbage. Somebody had to do it, but it was a low guy on the totem pole. And so if that's your chore at the house, um, I had relegated that chore for years. I have re-inherited that chore at my house. As a matter of fact, I forgot that chore Last Wednesday night, um, and I woke up to a text message Thursday morning from um, my beautiful bride that says, trash days today. No, oh, no, no, beat the trash man. You ever play beat the trash man? <laughs> it can be 20 degrees, you're running out of there, slipping and beat the trash man. I successfully beat the trash man. He's still the youngest. He's tending the sheep. Samuel says, send for him. We're not going to sit down until he arrives. In other words, everybody stand. We're not changing modes until he gets there because I got to see what the deal is. So we sent for him, had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise up and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, 
And from that day on, look, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. That, 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 that last sentence seems very insignificant. I think it's worth underlining. We'll come back to it. So Samuel goes through all the sons, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing crickets. They get David. They bring him in. God had his eye on David when everyone else had forgotten about him. And I want to just talk to you. If, if you feel like you're in this waiting season or this wilderness or this forgotten season, you're like, I don't know if anybody knows I exist. I, I don't know if anybody hears me. Do you see me? God says, I see you. And I'm up to more than what you realize. God has not forgotten about you. He has not overlooked you. He is, look, 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 he is positioning you. He is positioning you. Oh, David, he, he's just out feeding sheep, you know. He's just, that's, no, you don't mean that sheep herder. You don't mean the garbage man. You don't mean the, David's the sheep guy. Just, we're here. What? Go get them. Go get them. Go get them. So the Bible instructs the prophet to take a horn of oil. So there's times at this church where we will um, anoint you with oil. What that means is we'll smear some oil on you. That, that word anoint means to smear, to spread, to pour. But what we do is not what he, he did. Um, we'll take a little bit of oil out of obedience to scripture, right? It says anoint with oil. But he took a horn. So a horn is, um, how do you say it? A horn. <laughs> a hollowed out horn full of oil, full of anointing. And he says, anoint him with oil. So here comes David. God says, that, there he is, and he just walks up to him and dumps it over his head. Is that coming through the sound? Am I, am I doing it? I'm That's the bubbling sound of oil coming through a full mane of hair. In the, in the Bible, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Just like that oil was coming all over, the Spirit of God came upon David in power. Jesus Christ, uh, Messiah, Christ means anointed one. Uh, 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 anointing, uh, when, when someone in the Bible was anointed for something, it, 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 meant, it meant there was a blessing and a purpose for them. It was a blessing of God and a purpose for them. Friend, this is what you need. This is what I need. This is what we need. In order to accomplish the plans and purposes of God, in order for you to fulfill your destiny, we must have the Spirit of God upon us. We must be anointed by the Master for His purposes. There must be a present, more presence, more than just hours at work. God's spirit at work. And I go back to Isaiah 40, 29. And here's what it says. Isaiah 40, 29 says this. He strengthens. He strengthens those who are weak. Anybody ever felt weak and tired? Oh, anybody? Come on. Just, no, 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 no. Maybe after this weekend, you're like, if you ask me to do a three-day weekend again, I'm quitting this church. But weak and tired. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Even those who are young grow weak. Young people can feel exhausted, but those who trust in the Lord for help, there it is, underline that, those who trust, trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed, and and here's the picture of what that looks like, they will rise on wings like eagles, they're going to rise like like that, like, you see an eagle just, They just jump off a cliff, and they don't even do anything but put their wings out, and they just, 
A thermal draft just lifts them. It's amazing. Trust in the Lord. That's what that's like. I will lift you. They will run and won't go weary. They will walk and not grow weak. It can be tiring in the waiting room. It, 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 it can be exhausting in the waiting room. The waiting room honestly can be hard, right? It can be hard. And I don't want to overcomplicate things today, but some of us may, may, some of us may have been trusting in the wrong things. But those who trust in the Lord for help, that's where the strength comes from. Maybe we've been trusting in our own gifts uh, uh, and our rich uncle's money. You got a rich, rich uncle? No, not me either. <laughs> I do have a cousin that caught a 14-foot alligator, uh, went hunting. You can check it out on Facebook, Kyle Mills, 14-footer. Um, country boys in Alabama hunt for deer. Country boys in South Florida hunt alligators. <laughs> 14-footer, baby. Some of you have been saying with your mouth, God, I trust you. But the truth is, with our actions, we're doing something else. Can I go there for just a minute? We, we, can we just let the word kind of step on our toes? What does trust in the Lord look like? Trust in the Lord looks like following through with our actions everything we know we're supposed to be doing. How do we know what we're supposed to be doing? From the word. Following with our actions everything we know we're supposed to be doing. Here's what happens sometimes. We let our stinking thinking interfere the whole process. We over analyze everything, right? We, 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 uh, we get analysis paralysis. Let me think about that a little longer. Going to all the world, preach the gospel, uh, I'm going to pray about that for 12 teen years, right? Uh, 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 we just over, over analyze everything, over analyze everything, over analyze everything. We think it's for somebody else, and the power of the word works when we say yes to it. So if you're waiting on the lift for your wings, jump off the cliff and say yes. <laughs> it means saying yes to everything you know you're supposed to be doing, and as God introduces new pieces of information to you, you say yes to them. In relationships, I don't understand what part of unequally yoked we don't get. God has not called you to date unbelievers. Well, I thought that would go over better. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Here's a question, and I'm not trying to beat anybody up. Seriously. Sometimes we can spiritualize the call to ministry, which I think would be appropriate, but we under-spiritualize everything else. Why can't God call you to the classroom? Why can't God call you to the bank? Why can't God call you to the VA center? Why can't God call you to, the, to, the, to Starbucks to share the gospel? Why can't God call you to, to, to Walmart? Why can't he call you to that engineering firm? Why can't, he call, why, can't, why can't he call you to that? And if we're not careful, the Bible, that's just for everybody else. And we miss the opportunity, right, to jump off the cliff and let the, the, the thermal draft lift us up. And we, and we think the stuff about money in the Bible is for, for somebody else. Right? And we're so, e oh, it's so easy to spend somebody else's money. Well, I think, you know, if I, I wouldn't drive that, that car, that's kind of kind of pricey. I'll tell you what I would do is I'd give it to the poor, and you don't even tithe off the $20,000 you make. I'm like, no, you wouldn't give that to the poor. You're not even faithful with a little. <laughs> and we think it's for somebody else. Right? We say, God, uh, help me with... Overcoming your fears. It's not for somebody else. It's for us. Right? We think holiness is for the preachers and priests and nuns or something. And we miss the opportunity to grow in the waiting room. Now, while I'm offending everybody, I'll just use some of Jesus' words. 
He had a situation similar to this, and he was so mad. Here's the words of the master. And I'll, I'll quit yelling, because I don't want you to think, I'm an angry pastor, and God's angry all the time. Or, there's some things ought to upset us. Jesus says, you hypocrites. Throw it up there. Matthew 15, 7. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is, NIV uses the word farce. That's what it's like. And just if you don't know what that means, it's a sham. It's, 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 It's a joke. It's illegitimate. It's fake. I don't, I don't want that. I, don't, I, I read this and I go, God, give me healthy fear of you, right? When I read, that's what I'm thinking. God, help me. How, there's, I, don't, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my family. I don't want it for your family. How do I grow? So you're saying I got to be anointed. How do, how do I grow in authority? How do I grow in, in anointing? Obedience is the foundation. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Uh, uh, um, Again, I don't want to overcomplicate this. Spend time with him. How How do I know the plan and purpose of God? Spend time with him. Let the word direct. Uh, um, Spend time serving him. Right? Find what it is. What, we're, what God's, and, and serve him. And you don't have to wait to go to Cambodia or Kenya or South Africa or Brazil. How about across the street? How about across the hallway? Right? He starts there. I study for application of the word. So my prayer and my hope is, or let me say this, I think, I think, you tell me, your prayer and hope is that as I'm doing this, right, as I'm doing all this stuff, that your hope, I would imagine, is that um, at least he's letting it work on him. I would, I, would think that's a, I would think that's a healthy assumption for a church to believe that, and I think you would be right, and that's my hope too, that this would work in my life. My prayer is that it would work in my life first because I'm the king of my kingdom and that it works in your life, that I would be able to empower you to say, yes, that's my kingdom and it's going to work in my life too. So obedience, time spent, service, spiritual formation, nurturing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Nurturing a relationship with, let him work with you through the word to bring change. He's really good at that. (laughs) Some of you ladies think you're going to change him. Can I just tell you, the change agent is the Holy Spirit. So maybe, just since I'm making everybody mad... You could spend more time praying for him and send the emails to Tim at Life Church you know, and serving him and believing God for then all, all day. I'm just, I want to be an equal opportunity offender for everybody. I'm just saying, he's the change agent. Do you see? He's the change agent. Holy Spirit, help me. He anoints us for what he created us for. There's an anointing for you. And just because you're not on the throne, just because you're not maybe in the place that you're going to land does not mean that God is not working on you to trust him in your kingdom right now. Third thing is this. Public fruit demands quiet pruning. Public fruit 
demands quiet pruning. So after, come on, after he gets anointed, he goes back to the field dripping with oil. It, the, story, the story seems so uneventful. Remember I said, uh, it's out of order, Vanessa. Can you throw up 1 Samuel 16, 13 again? So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon, powerfully upon David. Samuel went to Rama. What? 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 Wait, I just thought he, well, it's a king, right? Public fruit demands quiet pruning. So I just want you to imagine... Put yourself in the story. We're there and we're watching. We're at the campfire night. We're watching the whole thing. This is pretty exciting. Uh, you know, like drama's like a reality show. Um, and here's happening before us. David rolls up. He's like, hey guys, what's happening? Rizzlers? I mean, that was funny. Come on, that was funny. Uh, that's 54 trying to be 15. So. You're the one that started with the shiny head stuff, so. Rizzler. So he rolls up, right? Simeon said, that's it. Come here. And his brothers can't believe what they're seeing. He pours oil all over and he let David now has legit drip. Last time. He does. This wasn't a, like, you know, I'm not picking on that. Please, that's holy. I'm, I'm for that. He's dripping with oil. Here's a question. Who saw that? I think we got nine people in the story. Seven brothers, a dad, I say, prophet nine. Um, Jesse rolled a little deep, so he probably had a few guys helping him out. Maybe, maybe, maybe a dozen, right? Where's the crowds? They weren't there. <laughs> Ain't posted on social media. It's not snapping it. There's no reels. No, no body. Samuel went back to Samuel then went to Ramah. He just, all right, adios. David went back to work. <laughs> Who saw his anointing the sheep? And they couldn't tell nobody. I'm not trying to be funny. The sheep saw him. They couldn't tell nobody. Many times, God hides you so he can grow you. Many times, God hides you so he can grow you. David went back to the sheep. Where, what did he do? He, he did the last thing he was told to do. Right? I think... That's some pretty good life wisdom. What do I do when I know God has something for me next? I would suggest to you some of the soundest advice I ever received for my current season was do what he told you to do last. <laughs> do that. Right? Mow yards. <laughs> do your homework. Spend less than what you make. <laughs> David was found doing what he was told to do last. His pos he had anointing for what's next, but his current position was the same. Man, that was an, I mean, that was an amen moment. 
God used his current position to grow him into what he was anointed to do. God began to grow David where he was before he moved into his next assignment. His assignment before he was anointed was to serve his father as a shepherd, and God used David's faithfulness where he was planted to promote him to his next assignment. One of the reasons why the waiting room is so hard is because pruning takes place. Pruning takes place. This is a freebie, Hebrews 12, 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, Hebrews 12, 11, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. John 15, 2 says this. He, meaning Jesus, breaks off every, he breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And he prunes every branch that does bear fruit so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. The reason God's pruning you is because he's trying to get more fruit out of us. <laughs> um, um, synonym, um, productive, <laughs> gifts flowing, Jesus magnified, more submission, more of his glory, less of me. That's what pruning's about. So what did David do? He worked on his heart. He did three basic things. Number one, he became a servant. He became a servant. The king, Saul, was so disturbed, emotionally, tormented, spiritually, that he said, do you, do you guys know somebody that can play some music and make this go away? He said, there's this kid named... Je Jesse's son, I heard he plays and sings really good. He sings worship songs. He said, go get him. He didn't say the, the anointed one. He said, that kid who plays. He brought him into the king's presence. And the Bible says, um, David entered Saul's service. He would... The Spirit of the Lord would come upon David. He would play his lyre, instrument, string instrument. Then relief would come to Saul. He'd feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. David became a servant in the field and a worshiper. So quietly, David's working on his relationship with the Lord and no one knows about it until one day there's a problem. And who do they call? The little boy out in the field. The little unseen nobody, right? That kid. In your waiting, in your season of waiting, become a pas passionate worshiper of God. You, you will bring with you a presence that is so counter-cultural that it will be, it'll stand out. Third thing is he became very bold. God worked on his fears in the waiting. How do you know he's bold? We won't read it all because we're going to land this. But David goes to the... David's brothers were in the army, and David still tending sheep, and you know the story of Goliath, right? David and Goliath, that's that David, in case you didn't know, it's that the David and Goliath story, it's a real story, it's in the Bible, and that's the David, and there's Goliath, he's a giant, he's ta taunting, they're all scared. Jesse, dad, sends David with some supplies, some MREs and some food and some canned soup, whatever, right? Sort of. He sends the spies and he brings it to the front line, gives it to the brother. And David sees this giant like cursing God, making fun of them, yada, 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 I'll destroy you, and your God's nothing. And 
They was like, who? He can't believe what he's seeing. He's seen all the big shots. They're all scared. And David's like, who is this guy? Who, who does he think he is? First Samuel 17, 32. Don't let anyone lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant's going to go and fight him. Saul said, Saul said, are you kidding me? You can't go. This guy's massive. Like Andre the Giant size, bigger. Like for real. You can't, you're a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. In other words, he's huge. He's special ops. He can whip 10 of us. David said to Saul, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear would carry a sheep off from the flock, guess what? I went after it. I struck the sheep. I struck it, rescued the sheep from his mouth. And then, then the lion and the bear would turn on me. I seized it by his hair and struck it and killed it. That brother had been whipping wild animals when no one's looking. And he's like, this guy's no different than them. Let me add him. How does that happen? That happens because in the waiting season, he let God work on his heart and he dealt with his fears. <laughs> He faced those battles there. He says, your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. <laughs> the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Let me at him. Everything David did, he had success. Or Sim 18, 14. God was building his character. And what I'm suggesting to you, what I'm saying to you as we land this thing is this. You might be in a season of waiting, right? It's not a wasted season. <laughs> it's not a wasted season. God builds our character and our calling in the waiting room. Character's built in the desert. Character's built. Listen. Character's built many times in the season you don't want to be in. How you live in this season will determine what it looks like next. And God will appoint you to your new assignment when he's ready. Our job is to get ready what's next. And you might be 90-something in here. And he is not done with you. He is not done with you. This is not for 18-year-old boys, men. It's for all of us. What do you believe in God for next? Dream again. Look, look at me. Dream again. In this season, dream again. Dream again. You might be in a season of waiting, in a holding pattern. Let God work on your heart. Let him work on your heart in the season. What's something in your life that you feel like you're waiting on God for right now? What are you waiting on God for? What, what, what are you believing God for? You're in that season, right? This is where you're at. Let him work on you for what's next. You may think, I don't have a next. I've done my deal. I would say to you, not true. I would say to you, not true. I can't find that anywhere in this book. I can't find it. Oh, it's going to look different than when you were 18 or 14 or 30 or whatever. Yeah, but do not get discouraged in the waiting. Let God work in your heart. Would everyone in the room open your eyes and stand up? flip the script I feel the prophetic thrust of this with such intensity and I know for certain that God is zeroing in on many of us and I try to give practical things rather than just theological truths that are elusive God is working on 
your heart right now for what's next. And with every body standing and every eye open, here's what we're going to do. You say, I identify with that. I kind of feel like I'm in this transitional season. I, something's next. I feel it stirring. I feel it. I feel uh, there's something next. And don't think this is for somebody else. It's for you. It, I, I know it's, and I'm saying, God, I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm, your, who, 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 I'm yours in the waiting room. And if that's what you want, I want you to come out of your seat right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm in this, tri- I'm in this season of preparation. I don't, I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours, God, in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm, I'm yours. Come on. Come on. I'm yours. I'm yours in the waiting room. You say, I, I want to have that trust in the Lord with all my heart. I want to have those who trust in the Lord for help. That's where I want. I'm, I'm, I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. Come on. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. Let God begin to shift your eyes from your surroundings to him. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours in the waiting room. I'm yours. Just begin to tell him right now. Begin to tell him. Just begin to tell him. Just begin to tell him. I'm yours in the waiting. I'm yours in the waiting. I'm yours in the waiting. It's a holy moment. I'm yours in the waiting. I'm yours in the waiting. Yours in the waiting, Jesus. 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 Just lift your hands and surrender to him right now. Lift your hands and surrender to him right now. I'm yours in the waiting, God. I'm yours in the waiting. Begin to tell him. Begin to pray, God, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. Come on, on, tell him. Lord, we trust you. We trust you this morning. We trust in you, oh God. We trust in you, oh God. We trust in you. I feel like the Lord would say to, to us this morning, quit looking around, lock eyes with me. Lock eyes with me, the Lord says. Look at, look at my eyes, the Lord says. God, our trust is in you. God, I throw myself on the altar. God, my trust is in you, God. My trust is in you, God. I just begin to pray prayers of surrender. Begin to pray prayers of surrender. God, we surrender. God, we surrender to you. God, we surrender to you. God, we surrender to you. Our trust is in 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 you. God, we surrender for you to you, God. God, we surrender to you. Our trust is in you, oh God. Our trust is in you, oh God. Our trust is in you, oh God. Now ask him to anoint you for what he has. Ask him to anoint you for what he has. God. God, anoint us. Anoint us for what's next. Ask him right now. Oh God, we need your oil. God, we need your oil. We need your oil for what's next. God, I don't care if anybody sees it. I don't care if anybody recognizes it, but if you do, oh God, that's good enough for me. Oh God. (laughs) 
Oh God, help us. Anoint us for what's next. Anoint us for what's next, oh God. Anoint us for what's next. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're the Holy One. We love you, Jesus. 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 I want you to continue to just ask God for what's next. Our worship team's going to sing. I'm going to come by. I'm going to anoint you with oil. And believe for an outpouring in your life. Jesus, anoint us for what's next. Anoint us for what's next. Anoint us for what's next. Anoint us for what's next.
sing that, sing that. Hold on to the Lord as your triumph unfolds. He's never failing. He's never failing. Take courage, my heart. Father, as we go, I bless your people. God, strengthen us to walk in obedience to you. Strengthen our faith in the waiting room. God, work on our heart that we would trust in the Lord with our heart. God, I pray that you would pour out your oil on us for what's next and give us the integrity to quietly worship and serve you until your season of promotion opens. Thank you, Lord, that you modeled servanthood for us the best. Empower us to be like you, Master. Power us to be like you. As we go today, God, encourage us in our walk with you. I pray our faith would be contagious and the joy of the Lord would bubble over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.